what is the likely outcome of the next recession? Do you think? You, you, I mean, I'm I'm just saying from my perspective, I'm not going to cut off my Spotify. I don't know if I reflect that's reflective of other people as well. We just went through that, and unfortunately, in 2020, what happened? The paid media, paid subscriptions went up. Right in good times and in bad, you're listening to music. Right, it's it's really not correlated. Like music is something you're not going to cut off. Moreover, like in bad times, you're going to listen to music if you're going to stay at home. In good times, you're going to listen to music. You're going to celebrate. So, I, you know, it's something. Our view is that music is a necessary consumption, like food, like water. Right? It's a. It's not. It's not correlated. How can investors be exposed to one of the largest and most popular industries in the world, music? Doesn't matter which walk of life you're from, you're probably consuming music on a daily basis. So how can you invest in the industry? Well, one investor has created an ETF that helps investors do exactly that. His name is David Shuloff, and he is here to talk to us about MUSQ, a new ETF that just launched last month. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me on your show today. Yeah, pleasure to speak with you and about one of my personal favorite topics, music. Um, passion project of mine, I told you offline I wanted to be a musician. Uh, as you can clearly see, I am not. Uh, but you have 25 years of experience working in the music industry. Tell us about your background leading up to launching this fund. Yeah, so I've been an investor, owner, entrepreneur, executive in the music space day for 25 years. Uh, started and sold a few different companies, worked at some labels and publishing companies, uh, so I've been around it for a long time. First job was at a company called Interscope Records. I worked seven years at Disney. I then founded a, my private equity backed company called Evergreen. We bought 26 companies. I sold that to KKR. It became BMG Rights Management. Last four years, I was at a company called Live One Music. Uh, I was the president of music publishing there. We own Slacker Radio and Podcast One. So a lot of experience around music in public and private companies. During your time over the uh, past 25 years working in the music industry, what would you say were the sort of biggest changes in the way artists, record labels, and publishers made money? Yeah, well, look, in 2005 was sort of when Napster kind of hit, right? So I watched, I was right in the middle of a storm going from CDs to Napster. You know, it's kind of like being in the restaurant business and all of a sudden people were eating food and then running out without paying the bill. That's kind of what it felt like being an owner of a, publishing catalog and a label. It was really hard to make money. Thankfully, there were other royalty streams. A nice thing about music is you get paid when songs get performed on the radio. You get paid when songs get played in movies and TV shows. So that side of the business, which is what Napster did, kind of dis kind of destroyed CD sales. And But that was only a small percentage of revenue. But as a result of that, you had technological transformation. You had Napster, and then from Napster, you had the iPhone, and then to, and that turned into the uh, fully legal streaming services you have today. So it was an amazing time to watch CDs get eviscerated and then get turned around, and now the streaming business is even bigger than the CDs were. And now you have a complete revival of vinyl and other things for super fans. So the whole industry is bigger and badder and better than it's ever been before. I want to come back and talk about the music industry. We're going to have a really interesting discussion there. But first, I want to talk about your fund and the holdings in MUSQ. Basically, your investment thesis. I think that's pretty interesting to, to discuss with our audience of investors. Your top holdings, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Sony. Tell us about your strategy here before we get into specific holdings. Okay, look, the strategy is simple. It's to give investors total exposure to the global music industry eco ecosystem. That means five different categories. That means streaming, content and distribution, live music and ticketing, equipment and technology, and satellite and radio. 45% of the companies on the index are domestic, 55% are foreign. We have 11 streaming companies. We have 19 content companies. We have six live music ticketing companies. We have nine technology companies, and we have seven radio companies. So this the MUSQ Global ETF tracks the performance of the MUSQ Global Music Industry Index, and it gives investors comp uh, exposure to all those companies. The top companies that you just referred to, Amazon, Apple, and Google, are streaming companies. And so the way these the way I define the rules of this index is that each of the companies has to generate more than 50% of its revenues from music 
or be a top five player or control more than 10% global market share in any of those five categories. Apple, Amazon, and Google, they control more than 10% of the global market share in one of those categories. They're also top five players. Now they are capped at 7%. So all the companies on this index are market cap weighted. They cannot have a minimum market cap less than $100 million. And they have to have average daily trading liquidity of $500,000 a day. Then the companies go up from there, but no single company can, can individually have more than 7% 7, 7 weight on the index. Otherwise, obviously Apple and Amazon and Google would outweigh the index. So at, at the very top, those companies can never be more than 7%, but I have to include them on the index because they're music streaming services after Spotify Apple, Amazon, and Google are controlling the streaming market. That's why they're on the index. Oh, I see. Okay. And so your play here is to bet on the expansion of streaming over the next couple of years. Is that kind of your thesis here? Well, streaming is is going to grow by you know fifteen billion dollars in the next seven years. So we believe uh, we believe that streaming is a huge component of uh, of this of, of the thesis here. Thirty five percent of the companies are streaming companies. Thirty five percent of the companies are content companies. So we are big believers in streaming and content. Do you, you don't see any disruptions or disruptors to the streaming industry, like another Napster, quote unquote, to streaming down the line? No, I mean the only other player that I think will be good for the business is you have a you have TikTok that is now entering into the US market. So they're already in Indonesia, in Mexico, in Singapore. They just got the entire Warner Music catalog and they'll probably enter the US market at some point. So it just shows you the size uh, of what the opportunity is. So and like I said earlier, uh, these streaming stars, just, they're just scratching the surface. They're about to go through price hikes. They've never been through price hikes before in 15 years. Right, Some of them weren't around 15 years ago, but Spotify was 15 years ago. Apple was 10 years. Like They never raised their rates until Spotify was two weeks ago for the first time. Right, they were paying, and so now they're what? What they what they increase it by 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 a dollar by ten percent. So think about think about the opportunity there as a streaming company, right? If you are going to raise raise rates, and then there's obviously enormous impact to the labels that benefit from that because they get a percentage of the total content cost. They get a percentage of that revenue from the streamers, so they'll both benefit. So that's 70% of the index right there is really very much tied to streaming and content. I, I understand the appeal of streaming for the consumer. So you're paying a monthly subscription to access basically an unlimited catalog, more, more music than you have time to listen to, rather than buying a CD, an album for the same price, and you, you've only got like 20 songs in that album. I, I understand that, okay? But how profitable is it for the publisher to have streaming? So the publishers and the labels both benefit tremendously. They get so the the publishers every four years they get what's called CRB rates renegotiated for them. And the CR we're now on CRB four that gets negotiated by the National Music Publishers Association. They just renegotiated rates, and it's been a huge windfall for them. If you look in if you look like in the last week, every single record label and publisher that's public that's on our index reported revenues that were up anywhere from nine to twenty two percent. And a lot of that is from the price hikes and from the recently renegotiated rates that they receive from the streamers. So there, there's a direct correlation between their revenues to the streaming companies. Is this a high margin business in the sense that they have to, how much of that cut do they have to pay to the content creators and you know everyone else pay, working on that yeah. song? Yeah, generally it's 50%. So the revenues come in and they pass through 50% on average to the, to the artist or to the writer. The songwriter or publisher, and then the publisher splits 50 50 with the writer. Okay. Uh, is there a, do you see a movement down the line or potential for artists and creators to demand a larger share of this profit? I guess it depends on the artist and how much pull they have, right? Well, look, you see, I mean, Neil Young, you can't find his music on Spotify. He got, you know, he didn't like that Joe Rogan was uh, a conspiracy theorist. So he withdrew the catalog. They have a lot of, they have a lot of weight. Right. And so uh, but a lot of the artists, it's in their interest to stay on these streaming services because they benefit from from paid from paid subscriptions. So if, if, an, if an artist were to release uh, their own album through self-publishing on, on the Internet, is that an avenue that people are, are pursuing somehow? 
Yeah, there are, those are called DIY services, do-it-yourself services. So you have tons of companies. You have a company called Cobalt, which is private. They have a, a division called AWOL, Artists Without a Label, that does that. You have companies like DistroKid. You have companies like The Orchard, which is owned by Sony. You have tons of independent services. Look, the opportunity is very big for artists today. You know, AI is obviously an important topic. As a result of AI, you have artists, you know, uploading anywhere from 50 to 100,000 songs a day from like creation of new tools. And they're doing it themselves. They're distributing music themselves. I was a little bit surprised that NFTs weren't a big competitor to streaming because, you know, why, why isn't Justin Bieber putting his songs on an NFT and just bypassing the streaming services, right? When you think about it? Okay. Well, first of all, they are doing that. They they are connecting more and more with their super fans. So NFTs are are definitely a way that they're doing that through vinyl. You have companies out there like Audius, Lalo, that are allowing fans to get directly in touch with their artists. Um, and I think Snoop Dogg did an NFT, made 22 million. But you remember also, a lot of the artists are signed under exclusive recording contracts with the labels. They can't, if it were so, they can't just go around them to distribute their own recordings, right? So absent any specific carve out. So it's easier for an independent artist or a, call it a heritage artist who may be out of a deal with a label, but for a very, for a big pop star, who you know who's under an ironclad contract with a label? It's hard to do that, but suffice to say, NFTs represent huge opportunities for artists to connect with super fans. Okay, let's talk about the industry again. Uh, billions of dollars in revenue. I'm talking about the global music industry. Now it peaked around, but before the recent spike in recent years, uh, in ni- uh, late '90s, it peaked around 25 billion dollars, and then we saw this decline uh, to about 14.9, 15 billion dollars around the mid 2010s, and then it plateaued around there before spiking up again. What happened? Why was there a big decline in global uh, revenues in the music industry over the last well, yeah. uh, from, from 1999 to? 2010, yeah. Right. So, okay. So, from 1980, 1980 to 1990 was an explosion, right? You had basically everybody was replacing their collections of vinyl with CDs. So, CDs like did an amazing, you know, blew the industry, you know, to records it never saw before. And then around 2003, you had the introduction of Napster, right? Which basically, and the MP3 files, right? So, you had what happened was you had uh you know companies like pirate bay and and uh you know and and kazoo right that were basically ripping files from these CDs and and distributing them for free right if you recall those companies out there there were technologies out of sweden that were being developed that were ripping CDs and destroying MP3s. And then Napster came about, built a player that allowed for that. At that point, the genie was out of the bottle. Industry, the revenues plummeted because people were no longer paying for music. It was terrible. But as a result of all that, you had a new subscription service that evolved. And the first one to do that was a company also out of Sweden called Spotify. So cut to five years later, Spotify got all the licenses it needed from all the major labels. They said, basically, you have no choice. The genie's out of the bottle. These songs are everywhere. Let's create a legitimate service to sell to fans. And that's with Genesis of Spotify. And that was in 2000. And uh, I guess it was 15 years ago, right? So uh, yeah, about 15 years ago, it was started. And that was the Genesis of Spotify. And then obviously, it kind of grew from there. And today, they have 182 million, you know, paid subscribers. I think they have close to 240 million subscribers worldwide. And then in the last, you know, 10 years, you had then you had the creation of, you know, the iPhone. You had Apple Music, uh, which today is the second biggest service at 82 million paid subscribers. Then Amazon got into that business, and they're the third biggest service with 55 million paid subscribers. And then Google got into that service as well, and they're reaching over 50 million paid subscribers. So all of these services now are offering paid subscriptions to music. They have licensed all of the catalogs from all the major labels. Uh, and and they also have, you know, millions of independent deals with independent artists who are also distributing on their platform. And that's that's the way artists are distributing music today. You know, you still have, uh, interestingly, there's a revival of vinyl, right? And the number one vinyl record sold this year was for Taylor Swift. Those are super fans connecting with, you know, those are the Swifties connecting as super fans. So 
the industry today is uh, is completely back. Uh, you know, obviously streaming is big and, you know, live music is obviously having a massive run uh, since 2020 when we came out of COVID. Would you say that the per capita revenue, meaning the, the number of month, the, the amount of dollars uh, from each consumer is higher today than 15 years ago? Or is the industry bigger overall because more people are now streaming rather than just buying CDs, you know? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the industry overall is bigger, right? The industry is going to be Goldman Sachs and their Music in the Air report just published. It's going to be $131 billion uh, by 2030, so seven years from now. I think we're about 70 billion now. So it's going to double in the next, almost double in the next, uh, you know, seven years. Uh, and that's attributable to, you know, uh, paid streaming services primarily. Um, the ARPU is actually higher now than it used to be with the evolution of super fans and NFTs and vinyl and tours. So people, so, and the cost of tickets have gone up. So consumers are spending much more than they did, you know, five or 10 years ago for music. Is, is that because of, of the, just the appeal of the service itself from the, from the, from the music providers, or is that just because people have more money than maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Well, look, the cost is inflation, right? The cost of all this has gone up, has gone higher. So the cost of ticket sales have gone up. Uh, so I think there's just general adjusted inflation for why people are spending more I like to understand the business model of uh, of the um, of the streaming services themselves. So you, you've actually worked as an attorney in the industry. Maybe you can comment on the um, the, the rights issue here. So you've got let's say let's take Spotify as, as one example. So what do they mm -hmm. do? They buy the rights to the songs from the labels. The they don't buy anything. They don't buy. They they license the songs. They license okay. catalogs. So they okay. have agree they have agreements in place right with the labels, and they have agreements in place with the publishers. Right. They need two separate licenses there. For every song, every song has two underlying copyrights. You have a publishing asset and you have a recorded asset, right? You could have, take a song like, uh, you know, Blowing in the Wind, right? That was written by Bob Dylan. It was recorded by Bob Dylan, but it was, all, it was also recorded by hundreds of other artists, right? So there are different recordings of Blowing in the Wind. There's only one version of that song that was written those are the two different copyrights. And so Spotify requires agreements with the publishers and with all the labels and they license that and they have an agreement in place. They pay a percentage of the total content costs and a percentage of their streaming revenues, right? Back to the label or back to the publisher and then the publisher and or the label pass through that money down to the writer. Right. So two different licenses that are required. And every couple of years, those get renegotiated. Do you do you do you know roughly like let's say if Spotify makes a dollar off of a stream, do you know roughly how much of that dollar goes back to the label? You know, it's roughly I think it's about uh, it's about a penny a stream to the label to the to, to, to about a penny a stream to the label. Yeah. And then the label, 50 percent of that goes to the creator. OK, correct. Um, do do they have exclusive contracts such that like let's say Spotify is allowed to stream a Bob Dylan song and that song is not allowed to be streamed anywhere else? That's called windowing and new art and labels do windowing for new artist releases. So you might only be able to access uh say Taylor Swift's new album on either Apple or Spotify if they pay a window of exclusivity. So for some of the bigger artists they do that and they may actually only allow it to be downloaded too where the artist would generate more revenue, right? Because in your earlier example, you pay a fee, you get access to everything. They may actually require a complete download of the album because that used to be the business model, right? The business model used to be you paid a fee and you you paid, you bought the album for 15, right? 15 or $20, right? Now, right? So they kind of want to continue that. They don't want to just, uh, you know, stream it, right? So there is windowing that's done with um, with new artists. Because I, I, I think I, uh, I remember a case where Jay Z removed most of his songs from Spotify because I think he was launching his own streaming service or something. So I'm just wondering how common that is to have, you know, exclusive. Well, J well Jason, J Jay Z is a completely unique, unbelievable right. human being, right? And so he's got his own company called Title, right? So yeah. he wanted to do everything he could to kind of promote Title, and so he was doing that. By the way, he was giving other uh you know deals to other artists and he was asking them to and he was giving them equity in 
title. And in return, I think he was asking them not to sign up licensing deals with some of the other services. But for the most part, just so you know, like music is pretty much on all the services. It's rare, right, where you have one service where you only find that music there. It really doesn't work. People, you know, I think consumers have proven they want, you know, portability, they want convenience. And uh, so it's unusual for, I don't think you'll find any artist who's music is only on one service today. So I, I guess going back to your fund, if you're investing in companies like Amazon, um, Google, and Apple, these big streaming services, an investor might ask you, uh, David, are these companies actually making money from streaming? Well, look, they're, they're obviously big companies. Um, I think their music services are all making money. Yes, their music services are, uh, are each uh, independently making money, and they're reinvesting that into, uh, into those services. Is there a way for investors to invest in individual artists? Let's say, you know, I, let's say I really like Taylor Swift. Can I buy equity in some sort of Taylor Swift derivative? You know, there's been contemplation of that. Um, there's nothing been, nothing has been approved by the SEC. I've seen a few, uh, you know, token ideas where Taylor Swift would sell certain tokens, Swifty tokens or things like that. Um, or artists might securitize some of their music directly to fans. So I've read different business models around that, but it's really it's really hard to actually implement. I mean, I've been buying publishing catalogs. It's hard to get a deal done with one artist. So I don't see anything of that at scale. That's why I created this platform uh, was really to just get get exposure across the board on everything. Right? Don't pick one label. Why are you going to figure out if like Universal's the label because Taylor signed to it? Then you're missing out on Warner's that has like Bruno Mars, or you're missing out on, you know, John Mayer who's with Sony, right? So invest in the invest in the in this fund. You get access to all these companies. You get access to you know Warner Chapel Music, Universal Music Publishing, Sony Publishing, all the royalty funds too, Hypnosis, Reservoir, Roundhill and all so you're getting access to the whole ecosystem. You're getting exposure across the board. You don't have to pick one and you shouldn't have to try and pick one. It's too hard to pick one. You don't know it's such a crazy business, right? You have hits and misses all the time in this pop game, right? And now by the way, these K-pop companies are becoming massive companies. A company like Hive, which is on our index, that I don't know if you know, but they own, they bought uh, all the rights to you know Ariana Grande and Scoot and uh, Justin Bieber. So they manage, they man. Sorry, I should say that they bought the management companies that manage those artists. They bought a company called Quality Control. They have Migos, Little Baby. They're like big owners of big management companies in the U.S., like these the South Koreans, right? So, and their companies are huge today. Forget all the bands that they have, like BTS and Monster X and and other big South Korean bands. They're actually big owners of U.S. management companies. You have JYP, YG, YG Plus, SM Entertainment, Hi, big companies, and then you have their streaming services on the on the platform too. Genie, Cacao. These are all very big businesses. And that's the excitement, okay, about what is going on here, David, is this music industry is exploding around the world. It's so big and growing so fast that it's really hard to just pick one. You, you can't. It's moving too quickly. That's why I designed the index, was to give exposure to everything, get all these companies on the index, and give the investor an opportunity to participate in all these bands around the world. Generally speaking, since you're in the industry, maybe you can answer this question, what makes one publisher more successful than another? And I'll let you define success in whatever metric you want. Well, success is always defined in one way, dollars and revenues, right? <laughs> okay, the, fine. I mean, that, I, mean right. I mean, money, I mean, so the biggest music publisher today by market share and by revenue is, is Universal Music Group, okay? They are simply number one. They've signed the most publishing deals. They've acquired the most catalogs. So they own and administer. And there's a distinction there. Owning is owning, right? Administering is the right to collect income on that catalog that they may not own. They're the largest owner and administrator. Number two is Sony. Number three is Warner Chapel. Number four is uh, is BMG Rights Management. Um, so it's really by market share. Uh, you know, music publishing is basically three different buckets of income. It's performance income. That's songs that get played on the radio. That's about half the income. A third of the income comes from uh, streaming and what's called mechanical sales. Those are downloads, CDs, and streaming, right? And then a third of the income is really 
uh, like sync, which means like the songs get utilized in movies, Super Bowl commercials and so on. So a really good music publisher is able to accelerate in those areas. They can come up with great ideas to license those those songs for the Super Bowl. They can get other artists to re-record them. That's what a really good publisher does. Right. They get other artists to come in. I had my company called Evergreen. That's all we bought. Evergreen songs that could get re-recorded by other artists. That's what a good publisher does. So that's how they make money is by doing those three things. But those are the three biggest companies. But you've got other royalty companies. They're on the index. Like I mentioned, the royalty trusts are on our index. Uh, the South Korean companies are on our index. I think we have like 10 companies that are engaged in music publishing on our index today. How disruptive would AI be? I'll give you some examples. There are some companies now working on software that could write their own songs. I've heard AI-generated EDM music, pretty interesting. Um, house music made by computers, also kind of interesting. Um, I've I've seen AI-generated uh, performers, such so so like avatars that are that are lip-syncing to music. What, what how is this going to evolve? Look, AI, AI. The benefits of AI far exceed the the risks of AI. Okay. AI is a risk in every business, right? Are robots going to take control of like our businesses? Are we going to be out of jobs because of robots and drones and things like that, right? That's just like, that's silly, right? I mean, it's a threat, but the, the, the real question is what can technology do to grow the business? And what AI is doing for the music industry, it's giving artists tools they never had before to write and record music, to do their own virtual shows, their virtual concerts. Paul McCartney just used AI to record one of the tracks with John Lennon on his new album. You know, there's like really a lot of opportunities for artists to use AI to their benefit, right? And so, look, could you have a, a robot doing like what happened? You had a fake weekend and you had a fake Drake, right? That kind of were up on Spotify, right? What happened when that happened? The, the lawyers from Universal sent the takedown notice and fake weekend and fake Drake were gone, right? Like in nanoseconds, right? So like there is a risk, right? That's a piracy has always been a risk in this business, especially in our business, right? This, well, this, is, this isn't so much of a risk, but can you foresee a future in which a robot would be more popular than a Drake? So your question, Dave, is would a robot be more popular than a superstar than Drake? And the answer is simply no. Artists want to understand the stories of the artists, right? They they connect with no robots, right? They want to go to a live show to learn about the artist, right? Springsteen is from Freehold, New Jersey, talks about his stories from Freehold, right? Taylor Swift talks about her stories of, you know, her boyfriends and whatever. So like robots can't really tell stories, and you can't go see those robots live. Maybe maybe you see one avatar. It doesn't make any sense, right? At the end of the day, these artists are talking about real stories, whether it's about politics, whether it's about civil rights, whether it's about boyfriends and girlfriends. And that at the end of the day, that's what makes a fan. They connect with that, and then they want to go see a show. So uh, to, to have some animated version, I mean, you know, to like connect with an ant, with an ant, just doesn't work, right? So the short answer is no. Okay. Uh, what about threats to, or not threats, but um, alternatives to live concerts? So Taylor Swift's era tour, record breaking. We know it actually lifted some uh, <laughs> local economies where it was operating. Um, the question is whether or not the metaverse could take over concerts. So why go to a Taylor Swift concert when you can view everything virtually through a headset? Is that uh, coming? Have you been to a Taylor Swift show? Uh, personally, no. On my on my bucket list. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take you next. I'm gonna take you one with me. <laughs> All right. You, you, you can never replace the experience of being at a Taylor Swift show, and you can't explain and you can't replace the experience of being at a Springsteen show or a Harry Styles show or an Ed Sheeran show or a Sam Smith show. Right? These are live experiences. No metaverse can recreate. It, it, the metaverse, what it does is it actually creates additional revenue streams. It creates opportunities to generate more revenue, right? So, you know, if you're buying a, uh, you know, a headset, a virtual reality headset, right? That's exciting. You can maybe re re-experience that. It creates, you know, maybe to, I, I'd love to actually see the Aeros tour on a headset after I saw it already, but nothing, nothing replaces the live experience. I don't care. Even, even if you're in the back row of like the stadium, right? At SoFi Stadium, nothing creates. The metaverse can't replace that. It makes sense. Uh, there's different uh, revenue streams for ticketing as well. So how do you feel about the rise of NFTs to be used 
as a ticketing item. Do you think that there's some value to be added to have a ticket on the blockchain? So look, the blockchain is something very special um, for everybody in this ecosystem, right? It creates a direct payment rail, right? Between when you heard it and when you get paid, right? Or a ticket that gets sold. So it affects everything. Right. Like we want the blockchain as a music publisher. Right. Because theoretically, when you hear the song once, there should be like a penny or whatever in your bank account at the same time. That's in a perfect universe. Right. So I think I think and that's great for that. Right. Um, it's great for the whole ecosystem of music, not just for ticketing. But, yeah. So I think with ticketing, it would be great once you spend if you know, if uh, I think the number is 13 million dollars on gross ticket sales for every Taylor Swift show. Right. She shouldn't. She should know how many tickets she got sold and how much she gets paid, and it should be in her bank account there. And I think blank block, blockchain will will are the other types of digital tools that will help uh, ticketing companies like Live Nation, or Vivid Seats, and CTS Event. I mean, all these companies are on our index, by the way. If you look at all of our holdings, we actually are positioned well to capture that innovation when it's ready. When it's going to be used, it's going to be used by we have the leaders in that space, Madison Square Garden. Sphere, Live Nation, CTS Event, and Vivid Seats, all those companies are in the in the live music and ticketing space. And when blockchain is available to be used, it'll be used and we'll be there to capture that innovation. Okay. Over the last 25 years of you working in the industry, how have the tastes of consumers changed in regards to the type of music they want to listen to? Have you noticed a shift? Well, I think it's easy. You had the hair bands of the 80s. You had the grunge artists of the 90s. You had the... Uh, M and M's of the 2000, and then you know, uh, you know. So there's a there's definitely a trend every decade. Um, but suffice to say, the one thing that unifies everything is that the artists that have longevity are the ones that write, are the ones that write their own songs, the ones that the ones that actually tell their own stories. The artists that kind of lean or depend on a producer for a track or depend on a co-writer for a song. They don't really have that longevity. They really have to be involved in that writing process. And that's the one thing that separates the artists that are that have been around for such a long time, whether it's U2 or again Springsteen or, you know, they they they've been writing their material for 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 decades, right? And they're writing their own songs and they're telling their own stories. Well, how, how, what comes first, a, a, a trend shift in, in our social economic landscape mm-hmm. or artists wanting to write about different things that impact the way we we as people view our society? You know, what, what, what needs is a chicken and egg problem? Yeah, look, I think the artist is a storyteller. The artist is talking about a problem, right? And they're asking you to listen and they want to connect with the audience to talk about that problem. Sometimes they offer solutions, sometimes they don't. An artist like Tupac Shakur was a brilliant writer. He was talking about poverty. He was talking about some serious problems. Same thing with Biggie Small, same things with a lot of a lot of the rappers. Right. And so it comes out of a movement. It comes out of sometimes it can be a lot lighter. I mean, country artists, they like talking about drinking beers by the lake and racing cars. And there's nothing wrong with that, too. They like feel good music, you know. So but the art at the end of the day, the songwriter, the artist is a storyteller. And they want to connect with their audience and 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 all the record and the record companies are there to curate that music and package it in a way to connect with the with the audience. Have you ever been in a position working um, with publishers and also a publisher yourself later uh, to pick artists to work with? Well, sure. A good publisher identifies other artists to work with. So you have as a good publisher picks a song in a catalog and they come up with different ways to re-record it. So we've done that, you know, many times, you know, with different songs in our catalog. I mean, I had a song called Blue Moon of Kentucky. You may not know that song. That was a song written by uh, by Bill Monroe. But we had that. But that song was re-recorded by Elvis Presley, by Paul McCartney. And we went out there and we had that song re-recorded by tons of artists, you know. So a good publisher goes into uh, a deep catalog and comes out with uh, with songs Um and, you know, comes out with ideas to get other artists to re-record them. But but listen, but publishing today could also mean signing a writer producer who's writing, uh, you know, hits for other artists, too. So it's not just that it's a, you know, being a good publisher could mean, you know, signing a great writer producer and then having that writer producer write songs for Justin Bieber or Ariana Grande. And that, that, that's a good publisher does that. You got a lot of the companies on our index, like Reservoir Media. They're great at signing writers. And they're, so they're, if you look like 
all the artists on the charts today are, you know, cutting songs that are that they so Reservoir has little bits and pieces of those songs. How do you what 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 do you look for when you pick an artist to work with? Look, um, first of all, you always want to keep uh, the end goal in mind. You want to create a hit song, right? And so, in order to create a hit song, you need three different things, right? And you can never lose sight of these three things. Number one, you need a great song, right? You need great lyrics and great music. Number two, you need a great artist to sing that song, right? With a great melody attached to it. And then number three, you need great production, meaning you need the right producer to actually produce that song in a way that feels current, right? If you miss, it's like a three-legged stool. If you miss any of those three different elements of that, you will not have a hit song. So a good writer, a good publisher, a good label keeps those three elements in mind whenever they're releasing music. Okay. Last question. Do you have a personal favorite artist today? Um, you know, I listen to uh I listen to a lot of uh a lot of music today. Uh you know, I'm a big Sam Smith fan, uh, I'm a big Ed Sheeran fan, I'm a big Harry Styles fan, I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. You can call me a Swifty. So uh, you know, I love all I think contemporary music is great today. I'm guessing your personal tastes have changed over the years as well. We're we're not so much. Um Look, uh, you know, as a I'm a musician, a very amateur musician, but I play a lot of like country folk music. Right. So stuff like Neil Young, like Springsteen, stuff like that. But the stuff I listen to at home is, you know, I listen to the hits all the time. I got to stay current. I got to I got to know what's going on. So I, and I got a young daughter, too. She's she's constantly feeding me. You know, Dad, this is says, uh, Dad, this is uh you know, Megan, you know, Megan Thee Stallion's new record. And she's discovering this on like the platforms on like TikTok, right? So she's actually a great discovery tool for me. So I first hear it from her and then I put it in my, in my house and we listen to it together in the house. Oh, excellent. All right. Uh, we can talk all day about music. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'd love to have you back on and uh, talk yeah, more. No. Where, where can we where can we learn about uh, so, MUSQ? So, all right. Well, first of all, we, we've obviously got a, a nice website. All Everybody should go to MUSQ.com. Right. You can download the white paper, the fact sheet, the, uh, you know, everything, the investment case. And there's a pitch deck. Everything is there. I also ask everybody to follow me on LinkedIn. I write every single day about trends in music, themes, things that are going on. Talk about I talk about the different companies on our index. If there's earnings coming out, I talk about that company. Uh, so almost every company on our index, we have 47 companies across all those five different categories i mentioned there i write about them constantly i write about the industry regularly and uh and you can always uh you can always follow me there so all right we'll I put hope. the links we'll put the links down the description yeah. below but before we leave david can you give us one theme that you've written about recently on your linkedin yeah i think uh I think some of the themes I've written about publishing, I've been writing about lately a lot because like the earnings have been great. Um, I've been writing about, uh, you know, artist discovery, artist tools. Uh, I've been writing about AI. Um, you know, I've been writing really about just the different uh, the different companies that we have. Uh, honestly, I've been writing about, uh, you know, I've been just writing about streaming has been a, been a big popular, a popular theme. The industry is really going into rapid growth right now. With the price hikes, uh, and you know, I read this report uh, from J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan called music the most under-monetized media assets in the history of the music business. And there's a reason for that, right? For eleven dollars a month, you're getting access to like 180 million songs. It's a pretty good value proposition, and the price hikes are just beginning. And with those price hikes come more revenues that could trickle down to the labels, so the labels benefit from that. And the whole ecosystem grows. So, I, so I'm you're, very you're saying You're saying the streaming services are about to raise prices on us? No, I'm saying they raised it once. They're going to raise it. They're going to raise it again. If you look at Robert Kinsel, the CEO of Warner Music Group, he spoke yesterday. He says he anticipates and he expects the rates to continue to go up. And he doesn't think consumers are going to care. Right? Consumers will still pay for it. That's what makes the index. That's, it's so it's so interesting. Like, would you pay? Would you pay? You, you pay eleven dollars as of today to, for Spotify. I don't know. Maybe you have a family. Would you pay twelve dollars or thirteen dollars? You wouldn't cut I off would, your service. You wouldn't cut off. I your would service. pay. Yeah, I, I'd pay thirteen dollars. But at a certain point, I would look at my bill and be like, "Yo, this is this is getting out of hand." 
You know, okay. I, I don't know what that point would be. That would be an interesting question, and smarter people than me have looked into that. But yeah. Well, that's a hundred. There's 180 million paid subscribers on Spotify. You discount that by what you want. If, if if everyone agreed to pay that, that's another close to two hundred million dollars a month. A month. That's another two and a half billion dollars a year, and you can discount that the way you want. There's an opportunity there for the streamers to make even more money that they are. Um, so anyway, the opportunity I just think is very interesting. It's very big. It's not going anywhere. You know, everybody that has a mobile phone is a, is is effectively a a music consumer, right? Yeah. So, and it strikes me that this is probably recession proof because I'm not. You know, if a recession hits, I'm not going to cut off my Spotify for eleven dollars. Can I tell you something? I'm, you know, we didn't talk about that. That's what makes this index so unique. It's very not. It's not correlated in many ways. The paid, the paid model is very nothing to do with advertising, right? That's thirty five percent. The labels have nothing to do with advertising. That's another thirty five percent. Live music's got nothing to do with advertising. That's another ten percent. Right. And then equipment technology has got nothing to do with it. The only thing that has to do with advertising are the radio companies like iHeart and Sirius. Right. So 10 percent of the index is, you know, has some vulnerability to uh, to advertising shortages. Right. And the economy. Ninety percent of this index really doesn't. Do, do, do the streamers make money from advertisers? They do have advertising on their service, but the bulk of the revenue is from paid subscriptions. OK, interesting. Yeah. And you don't, I don't, I don't have the data to back this up myself because streaming is a relatively new industry, hasn't seen many recessions. What is the likely outcome of the next recession? Do you think? You, you, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying from my perspective, I'm not going to cut off my Spotify. I don't know if I reflect. That's reflective of other people as well. We just went through that, and unfortunately, in 2020, what happened? The paid media, paid subscriptions went up. Right in good times and in bad, you're listening to music. Right. It's it's really not correlated like music is something you're not going to cut off. Moreover, like in bad times, you're going to listen to music if you're going to stay at home. In good times, you're going to listen to music. You're going to celebrate. So, I, you know, it's something our view is that music is a necessary consumption like food, like water. Right. It's a it's not it's not correlated. Uh, people are going to spend. And then like and there's also all these other outlets around it like fitness you saw like peloton and the influence that it had people want to get healthy you know the you know music is is benefiting from all that so it's just a uh it is really part of humanity uh music consumption is part of humanity i just don't that's why uh that's our view it's it's not correlated for many reasons and that's a big part of it and musq is listed where again the MUSQ, uh, Global Music Industry Index, the ticker is MUSQ, is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate your thoughts. Very thorough discussion about music. We'll, we'll chat next time. More to talk about for sure. Anytime. Thank you, David, for having me on your show today. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.